Hello and welcome to this week's episode of The Insider, brought to you, as ever, by Vanishing Inc. Now, you know how every magician has something on their website that says they're award-winning? Well, my guest today really has won multiple awards. He's appeared on Foolless, and he's not only an incredibly busy worker, but an astounding creator, with smash hits like The Silent Treatment, Destination Box, Paragon 3D, The Pain Game, and so many more. His release, The Perfect Score, was a device to make sure that everyone can do a perfect Mercury fold every time. Ladies and gentlemen, it's John Allen. John, how are you this afternoon? I'm very well, thank you. It's nice to talk to someone in the same time zone as me. <laughs> Absolutely. <It is. laughs> John. Yeah, I'm very well. How are you, by the way? I am, I am delicious. Thank you for asking. I um, haven't licked you, so I don't know. Well, uh, we can arrange that. Um, what's your magic origin story? You've got 27 seconds. I started when I was young and I'm still doing it. Great. Let's go back to 2009 when <laughs> That There Vanishing Inc. published your book Experience the Magic of John Allen. It was a yes. bestseller for us, still selling copies today, and that all happened long before I joined Vanishing Inc. What's the story of how the book came to be? Ooh, um, Andy Gladwin... I know him. ...begged me. <laughs> uh, no, it, it's a long time ago now, but I do know that... Um, that Andy was interested in putting out a book. I don't think Vanishing had put out any books before then. And uh, so this would be their first one. And, um, you know, Andy, I guess, is a fan of my work. And so he wanted to, uh, to do the book. So um, we had a discussion and uh, I knew that he would do a good job, seriously, um, and that they would put all their resources uh, into making sure it was a good book and uh, as the results show it is a good book so <laughs> so um, yeah I was I'm, I'm just very proud that it was the first book that uh, that Vanishing Inc um, decided to do and sure, I think they've done a couple sure. of others since well, yeah, there, there's, there's been a few, a few yeah a few there's a huge variety of material in the book parlor close-up stage looking back now are there some particular standout items that you're still really proud of? Well, I mean, I'm proud of all of it. Of if, course. If, you know, if, if favorites, because it, it is mine, my favourites. Well, one thing, one thing I, I I did want to put in the book was my IBM act that I mm. uh, I won the uh, the IBM in '95 over in Oakland, California, and so I put that act in, and it, it's one of those where. I don't expect people to do the act, but it, I, I, I hope it's a lesson in how to put together an act uh, and how to make things flow. Uh, yeah, because you be dissect it in the book, don't you really? Yeah, yeah. And, and the thing with that is if I took out any one element, it would all fall apart because everything is, uh, just, it just flows to, uh, together. So that was that was important to to get in the book. Um, oh, some some other standouts. Um, uh, there's signal strength, which is a stand-up piece using mobile phones, which I like. Um, some a, lo a lot of the things are sort of variations on ideas or routines that already exist. Uh, I do a thought of card on ceiling. Uh, we had that. Um, and also Schrodinger's card, which isn't a trick in itself, but it did get magicians talking about it. Um, it's a, it's a, I, I go into why you shouldn't open the envelope when you do card to envelope in a wallet. Mm -hmm. So uh, that, that was really interesting. But you know, there, there's, there's lots. Professor's Nightmare, that's another one um, which thinking about it because we haven't gone through these questions ahead of time so I'm having to think yeah, yeah, yeah. in real time thank you um, Professor's Nightmare is one of those tricks where you know it, it's seen as old hat and hat lid maybe and you know you get them in Christmas crackers but I I just vary things up I do a no count false count where I can show three completely separate pieces of rope uh, which I love doing it in lectures because it fools magicians and then they see it and then they go, oh, you. <laughs> uh, 
Um, and so, yeah, it's it's a way of sort of maybe not modernizing it, but just changing what, what what's always been done. So there's a way to have someone else hold the ropes and they change in their hands. So yeah, it's, it's just things like that. But honestly, there's there's any number of things that, that I could pick out and go, that's why I really like it. Oh, killer, no filler. In, in the book, you, Basil, which is essentially a, a false cut, but it's written a bit like a, a short essay with a focus on how to make your magic resonate with an audience. 11 years later, has your thinking about how to make magic resonate changed at all? It, it may have got stronger. Um, I mean, I always, uh, I, I always say to magicians that my first priority as a magician isn't to do any magic. And it's not to entertain people either. Okay. And then that get, picks their interest. I say my first priority is to make people care. Because if, you, if, if an audience doesn't care, it, you can't do anything. It, it doesn't matter what you do. Now, that doesn't mean they, they have to care about the story that you tell. It could be your persona, you know, mm -hmm. or, or you're, you're an interesting person. It could be, you know, it could be the premise you set up. It could be the props that you use or, or just anything just to, to draw them in. So, yeah, just doing a, a false cut, uh, which was Basil. Um, I, I talked about being in hospital and uh, I, have, I have the scar here and um, it went through a muscle and I was, uh, when they, they knew I was talking about magic, uh, so they knew I did some magic and so they got me to, to do some like one-handed cuts and just to get the strength back. And so I, I, I learned this really fancy false cut uh, as a thank you uh, to the doctors, um, which is complete rubbish, you know. But as a story, it, it kind of, oh, okay, yeah, that's interesting, that's interesting. So, you know, I wouldn't just go up to a table and go, would you like to hear the story of how I learned this false cut, you know. Um, <laughs> but it, it's just finding reasons. Uh, and I know in, in uh, Joshua Jay's uh, new book, he uh, says that you can improve people's magic with one word. Um, and I've, I've, I've always said that as well. Um, the most important question in magic isn't what or how, it's why. Mm. Why are you doing it? Why should they care? If you ask yourself why, as a whole, you know, the, why am I performing this routine? What's, what's the point? What are people gonna get out of it? Why should they watch it? So there's the whole of it, and then there's then there's the uh, the, the sections within uh, the trick or the routine as to well why am I why am I putting this here or why am I going to my pocket and why do I need to count the cards? So yeah, always ask yourself why. That's fantastic advice. Wait, about the caring, are there is that something that's evolved? Is it something that's evolved so you, you know that they're caring or are there sort of checks that you throw out during a performance to see whether they're engaged? I mean, my check is right at the beginning. Uh, actually, in the book, I, I uh, talk about my opening line. It took me nine years to come up with an opening line for restaurants and groups of people. So I think far too many magicians just go in with the attitude of it's magic, so people are going to like it. Mm hmm why again that's going to come up so much I'm sure in the next uh, 20 minutes or so um, so I, I you know I don't impose myself on people before I find out what they're like um, so I, I try and get them to to care about it and one of the best ways is to get them involved mm. so I, I'm one of those performers and, and other people will disagree with me which is fine they're wrong but they disagree with me <laughs> that you know, to start off with something visual or a piece of flash paper that turns into a coin or, you know, uh, a sponge ball that turns into a giraffe or, or whatever, you know. Um, and wow, oh, you're a magician, we love you. It's like, no, you know, find, find out what they're like first. Mm. There you go. One of your favorite releases of mine is The Silent Treatment. Um, could you describe the trick for the four people listening that haven't seen it? And then tell There's us about how that. it evolved. Okay. Um, well, I'll, I'll 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 do that in reverse. Actually, okay. I'll, I'll tell you the effect afterwards. Uh, and, and I've said this before, um, but for the four people that that uh, that don't know it, um, 
the, the silent treatment came from a film with Nicole Kidman called The Others. Have you seen it? Mm, yeah. Years ago, yeah. It is, it is quite a few years ago. And I loved the premise of the film. So throughout the film, things are happening and you just don't know why. So maybe that the husband has left and someone doesn't turn up to the house and these things are happening and you have no idea why these things are happening. And you're following the story and it's a really good film anyway. And then you get to the towards the end and something happens that that doesn't quite fit and you go, hang on, what have I missed? Why is this why is this happening? And then there's a reveal. And that reveal explains why the things have been happening during the film. Okay. And you go, oh, that's why the vicar, and that's why the husband, and whatever. And even before I, I came out of the cinema, uh, movie theater for the Americans, um, even before I came out, I, I said, I want to come up with a trick that has that same premise of, not, of things happening, but you don't know why, and then that twist at the end. Because magic is very linear. Sure. Very linear, things happen, and then there's this bit of a left turn, and that's the magical surprise, but it has no relevance to what's gone on. Mm -hmm. So, you know, uh, oh, the, the, my, my note's in a lemon. That's why he put it in the envelope and burnt it. You know, it, does, it doesn't make sense. You know, the, oh, my card's in that box. That's why it kept coming to the top. It, it doesn't make sense, you know. So, so much magic is, is like that. So, at, one, at, at some point, a, a little bit later, uh, I had a really bad sore throat and I could hardly talk and I thought, what if I couldn't talk but I had a job? And linked to that, I thought, well, actually, if I had things written down, I wouldn't have to talk. Mm -hmm. But then I thought, well, well, actually, if I have things written down and I can't talk, what would be the reason that I can't talk? So the effect is I have my script um, and all, by the way, all magic should be described like this, you know, an action. So this is, this is Elmsley Count <laughs> with the elbows out, you know. This is Russian roulette, <laughs> card to box. So uh, this is the silent treatment. So it starts off with, and, and now I will present this without saying a word, and there's a few gags, someone thinks of a card. Um, and I go through asking questions about it, and they name their card, and then at the end, the, it says, would you like to know why, during this entire time, I haven't opened my mouth? So this whole time, people have been following it, but, but haven't really got any idea about why I'm, why I'm using the boards and not talking, what's the reveal with the card, what is it? But then I get that moment, which is the same as the others, would you like to know why? It's like, what? Hang on, what have I missed? During this mm. entire time, I haven't opened my mouth. And I want them to get there a split second early because I look up and out pops a folded card. So there'd be no cards in play, but out pops a folded card, I take it out, unfold it, and it's the card that, that they're, they're thinking of. And so that brings it full circle. And I, th I think it's rare. I, I actually can't think of another trick where the magical surprise is the whole reason for doing the trick. Mm. Uh, and so, yeah, that, that is a silent treatment. Um, I've, I've loved it ever since I, uh, I came up with it. Uh, I first did it at Fectors, and it just got a huge reaction from the magicians. I think because of that, because there isn't really a magic trick where you get to the end and the magic explains the whole reason for, yeah, for doing yeah. the trick, and you go. Yeah. So I, I, I just love it. No, it's a fantastic, it's a fantastic effect. Um, so that's a little glimpse into how that effect came to be. But a lot of your other releases, I don't know whether you think this is fair or not, seem to be solving problems with stuff that's already existed. Um, do you think that's quite fair? Yes. So, so what's your process for doing that? Is something comes out, you look at it and go, ah, well, maybe it should... How, how do you go about solving those problems? Well, if you go on, pick, pick, pick one and I'll see if I can uh, say why, why I came up with it. Well, uh, the if Paragon. You, Paragon. So, uh, yeah, Paragon was, uh, Wayne Dobson sent me his 360, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. which is fantastic. But personally for me, I didn't like the method. It's a great, it's a great effect, uh, but I didn't like the method. 
and I had, um, so I just, I just decided to change it for me. That was all, it wasn't about, oh, I've, I've got to put out a product right. that solves it. It was about how can I get this to work? I like the clear box idea, but not that method. And so I, I figured out a different method and uh, I actually sent Wayne a video of me doing my method, but making it look like it was his method. <laughs> And I hope he doesn't mind me saying, but he sent me an email about 10 minutes later. He said, what the F did you just do? He had no idea. <laughs> so, I had, so I had to tell him. So so that that was about a method that I don't like. And a lot of it is either I don't like the method or there's something about the effect. So something like the pain game, which is my nail roulette, mm. that was purely solving a problem based on that famous YouTube video of, of you know, excellent magicians impaling their hands. Yeah. I thought, how can I make that safe? And so that was possibly the only one where I set out to solve a problem okay. with the, the, the method. Um, so yeah, so, so yeah, Paragon 3D was, was, uh, was the method as well. Um, double back, again, was something where I thought I could improve on, on the visuals. So yeah, they're only, they, they can be small, uh, adjustments, mm. but they can make you know massive differences. Huge differences, yeah. yeah. It's like John Gustafero's one degree. Oh yeah, yeah. Um, when you kindly agreed to be part of our blog series about people's favourite card tricks, one of the three that you selected, and the other one, one of the other ones was double back, um, was the ambitious card. Yes. Uh, where you said that is a bit controversial, and where where do you think people go wrong with their presentations of this classic? And how have you solved those problems with your handling and presentation? That sounds very grandiose. That everyone else is doing it wrong, but I alone have solved Worship the problem. the Lord Allen. Yes. For you. Solved it for you. For me. Well, I, I, Ambitious Card is one of those love-hate card tricks. People joke around about it being you know, a half-hour routine and 753 phases and, and all of that. But... It's just, it's a fantastic trick. It, it really is. Um, you know, there's, there's so many different uh, ways to perform it. It can build. Uh, I mean, I can't imagine anyone doing like one phase, but just multiple, uh, just multiple phases and it can build. You know, if, if you're out in, in the, I was gonna say the real world, but you know, doing restaurants or events or whatever, you can just stop short. You know, it's not like you vanish a ring and then the food arrives and go, well, I'll be back to produce your ring in 20 minutes. <laughs> you know, um, you can just stop it at, at, at any point, really, uh, or just get to the end really quickly, some, yeah. something like that. But I think, I mean, I haven't seen everybody's presentation, uh, but a lot of it is, it's about, and if I put your card in the pack, it comes to the top, and then if I do it again, the same thing happens. And if I put your card in this way, and then if I do this, and all of it is, it's about what you're doing. Uh, I don't know who first named it ambitious card, but they've got a lot to answer for, you know, because it's all about being ambitious and, and being on top and, and all, that, all that sort of thing. So it's, it's all about the process, and that's what, mm. that's what I don't like. Uh, I think in, in, in my book, I, uh, I have Ad Libitious Card. You do. Uh, which, is, which is a presentation that I've done, well, obviously since, since, uh, since the book came out, but before then. And it's just a way to have fun. So the emphasis isn't on the, the card coming to the top or the, the method, but you're, you're just engaging with, with the audience. I mean, it's still very magical. It's still the Ambitious Card routine. But it's it kind of answers that why should anybody watch? Yeah, and it's again it's as I said before it's just one simple thing to do, and I'll be, not everybody would be able to do it. It's it's not everyone's how very British cup of tea. Uh, but for me, I I just love it. it. It allows me to engage. It allows me to have fun, and it's different every single time. And I think that's also something with Ambitious Card, thinking on my feet here, that 
it, it just gets so monotonous for the performer because all they're doing is exactly the same routine and it, with exactly the same wording every single time. And it's, you know, how do you keep it fresh? Mm. So I, I worked out a way to keep it fresh and, and that's, that's Adelibitious Card. There you go. Talking of um, engaging with your audience, Jason Alexander from that there Seinfeld says that he was surprised at how entertaining you were when you worked the close-up gallery at the castle. He said I don't specifically, think he meant it like that. <laughs> I can't no, believe it. No, he goes on to say something. He from what good. I've heard, from what I've heard, I can't believe he's actually entertaining. <laughs> Let me carry on. <laughs> okay. He said specifically Bring it back. about how he said specifically about how charming you are. How do you think magicians listening can improve or work on the way they engage with their audiences? Uh, you employ Jason Alexander to do your PR. Testimonial. <laughs> yeah, do the testimonials. Uh, how, 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 do they, how, how can, how can they improve, improve or work on the way they engage with their audience? Oh, that, this did actually come up on um, social me Facebook, social media, about you know, you can you can learn to be engaging. I don't know if you can. Yeah. Um, I mean, part of being a performer is knowing who you are. I remember Jeffrey Durham, um, very very well known uh, British magician. For those who don't know him, um, he was sort of you know a, a larger gentleman, and he wanted to be sort of the dove worker and um, oh, I can't remember the uh, classic guy. Who does doves? Channing um, Pollock. Channing Pollock, yes. But he knew that that wasn't him just because of his body shape. So even though that's mm. what he wanted, he realised. And you know, and, and if you're serious, then be that person. Don't try and be funny because you see lots of other people getting laughs or whatever. Uh, and there are some people who just can't do, let's say, serious mentalism because they're just this jokey person. Mm. So. You know, you've, you've just got to be you. Um, and, you know, it's not all about getting laughs. You know, as I said, if you, that whole thing about why should people engage with you, well, maybe you're interesting, maybe you're a storyteller. Mm -hmm. um, you know, it, it could be anything. Um, just find a way of, of why should anyone, well, why should anyone engage with you when you're not performing? Right. That's the thing, you know? Um, you know, it, it's it's said that you know p performers you should be you plus a little bit more. You know, if if you have a completely different character, that's something different. But you you should be you with a little bit more because then it, people can see that you're genuine. Uh, and I think maybe that's that's an important thing. You know, you you've got to be a bit genuine with your with with your audience. So just figure out why why you know when when you're with your friends or whatever, what is it. Oh, you know what is it about you that they like? Yeah. You know, don't don't yeah. try and be someone that you're not. You're a busy worker, as I said in the introduction, but you do something a lot of magicians do not do, which is perform almost solely effects you've created. Now, I imagine that most of the listeners don't want to really be that cookie cutter magician doing Rin Flight and Omni Deck. So what was your process like for deciding to use original material? What was that journey? like well I mean it starts off you know it's it's fine you know you you copy other people you, sure. you buy tricks uh, uh, it, it's well known that you know I'm a David Williamson fanboy uh, like the rest Most of the of world <laughs> um, you know and, and so I just when I when I got his uh, his video I, ju I just did those tricks uh, but then you then you just learn to be yourself in a way, uh, and you know the routines that I come up with. I think one of the things for me is that you know I don't I don't come up with tricks for the sake of it, or because oh it's got a really good move, or I think this is going to fool magicians. I come up with tricks and routines because I want to perform them, and so that's that's going to be important. Is you know you've got to to come up with routines or or just change things to suit you. So, you know, even if you buy a trick and you've been fooled by the advertising or something and you go this this is just not for me. What mm. a waste of money. It's actually not a waste of money because you've learned what doesn't work for you. 
you know. Like seeing so, a bad performer at a convention or something. Yeah. You can learn from seeing things exactly, that you don't like. Exactly. You go, oh, so that, I know that that's bad because I do it differently or, or that's ending up not getting a good reaction. But mm. I don't do that, so it, it, it's fine. So, yeah, you've, you've just got to come up with things that, that you like to perform. So, you know, I, I would do double back and I do Adlibitious card. I do Paragon 3D. Um, I do, you know, my, my uh, ring on string, uh, which is sort of the ambitious card of the jewelry world. You know, figure out your own routine for that. Um, and it's, yeah, just things that I love, I, I love to perform. Fair. And you, you come to the session most years, and I do remember about 10 years ago having a very drunken philosophical conversation with you about one o'clock in the morning. Um, what do you think makes it a good convention? Oh, uh, well, I mean, and Andy and Josh know how to put on a convention uh, and they they love magic, which which helps and which shows. Uh, I mean, I, I was there when it was there were about 50 people in a back of like, I think it was like an old age home or something like that. And it was a, just one little trestle table. Uh, and then it's grown to this this incredible convention that it, that it is today. Um, and I think I think also Andy and Josh have have the respect of the performers, so that they can get the the big names to come in, and likewise magicians, they they respect uh, Andy and Josh, uh, and that they know that they're going to put on a good convention, you know. Yeah. yeah. Uh, and I think they also move with the times as well, you know. It, it's uh, it, it's it's a mix of, you know, like the the traditional and the modern. So yeah, I, I just think they, they know how to put on a good convention. And you're going to be appearing um, in January 2022. What are you going to be sharing, John? What will I be sharing? Well, I, I do an, an any card at any number, which is a classic of magic. Um, and I, I was asked if I can give a short talk on it because as everybody knows, I'm an aficionado of any card at any number and card magic in general. But um, Andy, Andy did ask if I could do my any card at any number uh, at, the, at the session. Uh, I said I'd, I'd love to do it. Uh, so I know a few people have seen it, um, but not very many. And dare I say, it's, it's completely different to any other any card at any number. There's too many well, A's in there, but anyway. There's so, a lot of A's, but it's good. It's good T's. Yeah. So uh, there's a lot of pressure on me, uh, <laughs> but I love it. Uh, so yeah. So it's it's any card, any number, and I, I think like ambitious card. This is this is another trick that magicians have a love hate relationship with it. Mm. For some, it it is the holy grail of card magic, and for others, it's the most nauseatingly boring card trick that's ever been created or ever will be. I think it's what you said right at the beginning, is that most people haven't solved the why for it. Yeah. Why, why, why is it at that number? Why do they need to pick a number? Yeah, yeah. And, you know, magicians, quite rightly, you know, they look at the method, uh, they look at the effect, but then they stop there. You mm. know, and, and the presentation, not maybe too much thought. This isn't every magician. So if, if it's not you, I'm not talking to you. But you know, there's the met. Oh, well, great! I, I can figure. I figure out how to do it. I can figure out how to perform it. Great. There's a lot of others. It is that why. Mm. Why? Why are you counting down? You know, but a, a bit more will be revealed at the session convention, 2022. We're out of time, Mr. Allen. But we end the show with four quick fire questions. Are you ready? Well, considering I've just been thrown in at the deep end of this, um, yes. Okay. Favorite Is that the pizza first question? Topping. No. Oh, no. So it's five, really. Go. Favorite pizza topping? Uh, tuna and sweet corn for all my American friends. <laughs> Favorite movie? Favorite movie? I don't have one, but the others would be one of them. And No Way Out by Kevin Cosner. Favorite people or person that makes music? Favorite person that makes music? Favourite people or person that makes music? <laughs> I, uh, bowling for soup. And finally, 
Who would you rather fight? One massive Andy or a hundred tiny Joshes? Um, I think one massive Andy just to see what Andy would be like when he was massive. Mr. John Allen, thank you very much for giving us your time this afternoon and I look forward to seeing you at the session in January. I'm looking forward to it too. Thanks a lot.